Welcome back to another episode of the Economic Debate Series, where today we'll take the pros of universal basic income, and then later we'll also discuss the cons of universal basic income. My goal here is to basically provide the arguments on both sides of the argument, so that way you can better understand where someone who's disagreeing with you, where they're coming from. Or perhaps you haven't formulated your own opinion, and that's totally okay too. I'm not necessarily trying to convince you of the argument one way or another, like some news sources do, where they may tend to be a little bit biased. And if you want to help this channel out, be a resource for providing both sides of every economic issue, issue, then all you have to do is just hit that like button. But now let's get into the pros and cons of universal basic income. To start with the argument on why we should have universal basic income or UBI is that we have an ever changing global economy. Think about how labor was viewed 20 or 30 years ago. In the past, the whole idea of having a gig economy and that being a job didn't even exist. And now as people have these temporary contract jobs or jobs that tend to fluctuate a lot in hours, the need for universal basic income is even more relevant today. For example, let's say you live in a city that's a tourist type city where they benefit from having services like Uber or Uber Eats. However, the city only may have peak times out of the year that actually needs and requires these different types of services. So from the individual's perspective, they may not necessarily be able to survive on the income they generate just in those few months throughout the whole entire year. So they may take a different job. And from the city's perspective, they actually benefit from those different services. So it may actually be in their best interest to incentivize those people to stick around in time for those tourist type peak months. So if the city pays this individual a basic income that they don't necessarily have to generate on those months that they're not necessarily working in the tourism industry, then the city actually benefits because then it has a better tourism industry and then it actually generates more tax dollars. So in this scenario, it's a win-win for the city and the individual. The other major argument for universal basic income when it comes to the changing economy is how we look at automation and technology. Let's say you had a hypothetical city where you just had a team of engineers and all they did was build buildings. And let's say that these engineers had a way to create some kind of technology or automation that basically built buildings for them. They essentially would be inventing themselves out of a job and basically progressing society, but in a way that didn't necessarily benefit them. You could apply that scenario to multiple different fields where basically automation and the progression of technology decreases the need for human labor. And the other major consideration when it comes to automation and progression of technology is that it's gonna come regardless of if we try to prevent it or not. And sure, you can make the argument that these people who lose their jobs due to automation can just find different jobs in the workforce. But the problem with this argument is that it assumes that other industries and other jobs out there aren't being automated away either. On top of that, there's kind of a cost or a transaction cost in trying to find a new job. We don't live in a world where people and labor can move around freely and go from one state to another very easily. Think about somebody who lives in a city where the main industry in that city is just building cars and it happens that the car process actually gets automated away. So now you don't even have just one individual trying to find a new job. You have a whole group of people trying to find a new job at the same time in this city that's built around this job that got automated away. And sure, there may be some kind of construction job or other job that pays them similarly, but this job ends up being far away. Perhaps they would have to pay to move because they have to buy some kind of truck or rent a truck to move all of their furniture to this new location and how are they going to do that and afford that when they don't even have a job anymore the business loses out that has this construction job that remains vacant because no one can get there to be hired and obviously the individual loses out because now they don't have a job the other major benefit of having universal basic income is it essentially sets a floor for the amount of earnings that everyone will earn by knowing where the poverty line is at then it's a lot easier to provide a basic income to everybody and to ensure that everyone doesn't end up below the poverty line you see with very targeted welfare type programs they they end up being very convoluted and complicated. How much money for food does an individual need when they have three kids and can only find a part-time job? Compare that to how much someone may need for food that doesn't necessarily have any job, but they also don't have any kids either. By having universal basic income, it simplifies the process because then you're just paying everyone a flat amount. On top of that, it doesn't necessarily incentivize any people for mischievous behavior. I don't have an incentive to lie about my current financial situation to qualify for certain welfare programs because a welfare program being universal basic income in this case would basically simplify the process and de-incentivize people to lie. And by having universal basic income and kind of simplifying the way we help people in poverty or different people that need money, there's huge cost savings in the long run so that incentivizes people to even have more benefits available to them. Let's say we live in a hypothetical society where there's only three families and we all agree that everybody should at least be able to afford food. Family A and B need money for food 
food, but family C does not. If we pay family A and B $5,000 worth of benefits, but yet we have to pay an individual $6,000 to administer and kind of supervise this program, then in total that program costs $16,000. But let's say we use those funds in a more basic way. We split that $16,000 amongst those three families, so each family ends up having $5,300 or a little bit more. So every family actually ends up better off than they would have if you had paid someone to administer a more targeted approach. So just imagine all the labor, money, and time spent if the government didn't have to have thousands of different targeted programs and didn't have to worry about how to administer those programs. Plus on top of that, there's not necessarily this delay as far as the benefits being paid out because it's so simple, it will actually increase the speed of how quickly it is to be paid out versus more targeted welfare programs can take months and sometimes even years to qualify for. And you could make the argument that there's gonna be some individuals that don't necessarily need the universal basic income and they're benefiting from it. But that argument doesn't necessarily take away from the fact that people who need that universal basic income are benefiting from it. A major criticism of universal basic income is that it's going to end up de-incentivizing people out there to work. The problem with this argument is that all labor and production out there is not necessarily valued perfectly. Think about a mother out there that is in a well-off family and can dedicate and devote more time to being a good parent. They aren't necessarily stressed with having to work a day-to-day -day job, so perhaps they can end up being a better parent in that sense. By giving more attention to a specific child, that child may end up being a better productive citizen to, to the world because perhaps they end up getting better grades or better understanding math and engineering type principles. But let's say this person who would have made a good mother ends up having to work a job because they can't necessarily afford not to. So in the end, in the long run, society doesn't benefit from that child having a better education or more attention from a better parent. But the reason this is the case is because there's no value as far as that mother being able to parent their kid. They're not necessarily getting paid to. You could apply this whole problem of not necessarily being paid for what you're valued in a variety of scenarios. For example, someone that's collecting trash on the side of the road they're not necessarily being paid to, but there is a benefit to that neighborhood for that person collecting that trash. You see, the whole premise of someone being de-incentivized to be productive or work is that you're assuming that what they're gonna be doing with their time doesn't necessarily have a benefit to society. Someone may say, well, if I'm being paid a universal basic income, what's from stopping me from just sitting in my house and just painting all day? Is art not necessarily valuable to society anymore? Is having good mental health not valuable to society? Think about somebody who gets over stress from work, there's definitely a mental cost and there's definitely a financial impact to society as a whole. There are a number of studies out there that show when people are more stressed, they end up being less productive and they end up making poor decisions. Combine that with the fact that most people live paycheck to paycheck, then it's even a more relevant point as far as universal basic income being able to relieve that stress on people's minds. And if universal basic income serves as a safety net for everybody out there, then when offered a job that doesn't necessarily fit me the right way, maybe it's not something I'm not necessarily productive in, maybe it's something I won't enjoy, then I can hold out for a job that better fits my needs and my skill set rather than just accepting a job because I need an income. Or perhaps because I know I have this safety net, this universal basic income, then I'm more incentivized to start a business out there and that business leads to more technology growth and then society benefits as a whole there. In the end, universal basic income is about addressing the automation problem as well as the fact that there's plenty of jobs out there such as parenting that do benefit society but don't necessarily have have an income. And universal basic income is a safety net that no one can necessarily fall through the cracks of. Now to begin on why we shouldn't have universal basic income, let's start with one of these assumptions as far as automation. The whole idea behind the automation argument is that there's not necessarily gonna be enough jobs to replace the jobs that got automated away. We hear this argument be made pretty much any time that there's a new technology that's progressing and automating away jobs. But pretty much with any technological progress or automation, there's still been jobs to go around and these new jobs that usually get created are typically more enjoyable. Think about the manual labor involved with farming. This job would typically be very difficult, but now that job's been automated away, and now one person can drive a truck and take care of the whole entire job altogether, and driving that tractor is a lot more enjoyable than picking in the field. But on top of this, now you've kind of created this whole new industry as far as now you need jobs and people and labor to develop and engineer and even build those new machines. Or maybe these people end up moving all together and going to a city, and now the city has a 
pent up demand as far as building new apartments. And so now there's new jobs being created to build these apartment complexes or new services for the new population growth that that city has. Industries come and go and get automated away all the time, yet there's still jobs to go around and society still moves forward. The other major assumption being made here is that there's going to be a need for a certain level of income. I'm not necessarily arguing that there's not going to be a need for currency. There's still going to be some kind of form of medium of exchange as far as goods and services. But what I mean is that as automation and technological growth happens, certain goods and services end up being cheaper. So in that farming example, now those farmed goods are a little bit cheaper. So yes, I may end up having to move to a city and work a job that I'm not necessarily making as what I would have made had I worked on the farm, but because that produce is being harvested in a cheaper, more efficient way, now, even though I'm working a lower income job, that produce is a lot cheaper now, so it kind of offsets in the end. The same could be said for the automation of truck driving. Let's say that trucks are now you know, engineered in a way that they're completely automated and there's no need for a truck driver. These truck drivers may be displaced temporarily, but eventually they'll find jobs, even if it ends up being lower income. Now that goods and services are being delivered through automated trucks, then those goods hopefully are a little bit cheaper. So then it ends up working out in the end. And this doesn't even talk about the different jobs that are created because now you have automated trucks. They're sure to be a lot more maintenance involved as far as these automated trucks, especially because they're going to be driving 24 seven on the road. So there's definitely going to be a lot more maintenance needed. Now let's talk about some of the flaws as far as universal basic income. When you think about universal basic income being offered in one country, that incentivizes people from a different country to take advantage of the fact that this other country is offering universal basic income. If I lived in a country that I had a low income job and there was a legal way for me to migrate over to the country that had universal basic income, you can pretty much bet that that's going to be my country of choice compared to a different country where they don't offer universal basic income. Or even more of an issue is people qualifying for universal basic income in their resident home, maybe they're a US citizen, for example, but yet they spend the majority of their time abroad in a different country. So now you quite literally have taxpaying dollars being spent abroad and being funneled outward. And sure, there are probably ways to counteract these different ways of taking advantage of the program. But if the whole argument of universal basic income is it simplifies the welfare process and basically eliminates these costs convoluted type programs, then you can't really make the argument that we'll start to counteract these ways that people may take advantage of universal basic income. You end up regulating universal basic income more and more to the point that it's no longer a cheap cost-effective system. Another consideration that needs to be addressed is how do you combat the fact that people tend to adapt and get used to a new normal? For example, right now I may be stressed out about money, I may be unhappy and feel like my life could benefit from an extra $1,000 or $2,000 a year. But once I have that new normal for me and I end up having a new thousand dollars per year that I'm guaranteed, then I end up adjusting my lifestyle to basically fit that thousand dollars and I'm no longer satisfied. Given enough time, people have this lifestyle creep where they end up spending more and more. So having universal basic income won't really address the whole poverty issue because people in poverty will just end up spending more anyways. Another consideration for universal basic income that needs to be addressed is the long term implications. How are we going to run this program in the long term? Sure, maybe right now everybody agrees that $5,000 per year is enough for universal basic income, but given enough time, eventually with inflation and just different things that happen throughout life, $5,000 may not necessarily seem like enough. So to fulfill the needs of universal basic income increasing year after year, you basically have to tax the rich more and more every single year. And eventually the rich that live in a certain country that offers universal basic income may not necessarily be incentivized to start businesses in those areas. And sure, a lot of people may argue out there that the rich do need to be taxed more. But the problem with this argument is that you're basically combining two different arguments. You may still feel that the rich need to be taxed more and that wealth needs to be redistributed, but that's not necessarily a reason for universal basic income. Plus, as for people that like to point out that Alaska or different countries out there have offered universal basic income or forms of universal basic income. The problem with this argument, though, is that Alaska, for example, is a lot smaller than implementing this on a national level. And the different various examples of countries that did offer universal basic income offered it in a small time scale. So you're not really getting an accurate representation of what long term universal basic income would be. Because, for example, let's say I work a job and I work in a country that offered universal basic income and I wanted to quit my job, but I knew that the universal basic income was only offered for a year, I probably wouldn't quit my job. But if that universal basic income was sufficient and it was long term, then perhaps I actually would quit my job. So this is a good representation of how having a short term experiment doesn't necessarily play out too well on the long term. And for the people that like to point out that the stress of living paycheck to paycheck or having to know where your food or money for food ends up coming from, and that if you eliminate that stress, people would be more productive, there isn't necessarily too much proof that people would stop worrying 
caring and stop stressing about living paycheck to paycheck. And we can see this with the representation of high income earners. If you look at high income earners compared to low income earners and find out the amount of people that are living paycheck to paycheck, you would find out that it would actually end up being similar percentages. You see, the real problem is that some people end up living paycheck to paycheck, not necessarily because they aren't making enough, but because of the bad financial habits they have. And on top of that, you combine in this whole lifestyle creep that I talked about earlier, that ends up posing a problem that paying people more is not necessarily the perfect solution. But even if I did want to agree on the argument that people having a safety net as far as universal basic income, reducing the stress, and so people are more productive, then why couldn't I make the argument that there's certainly going to be people on universal basic income that are going to be de-incentivized and less productive in the workforce? If someone knows how to be very frugal with their money, then perhaps the universal basic income is enough for them to not necessarily work at all. And while certainly there's going to be people that end up benefiting society, using their free time productively to society, perhaps picking up trash, there are certainly going to be people that are going to be a net train to society. For example, because now they have more free time, they end up going to parks and they end up taking food with them all the time and they end up littering the park every single time that they go. And perhaps that's just a specific example, but in the end, any time you could basically make the argument that universal basic income is going to end up benefiting people because they're not going to be de-incentivized de to adding to society, you could basically make the counter argument as well for a lot of individuals. And as far as administering universal basic income, there's no denying that in the short term, it would have huge financial implications. In the short run, it would be so expensive to run universal basic income because you would still have to maintain certain welfare programs as people transitioned over to universal basic income. It probably isn't a great idea to offer universal basic income. And on that same day that you start offering it, you basically eliminate all the other welfare programs because then it's gonna just end up creating this complicated mess and it would actually cause more people to potentially fall through the cracks. So basically in the short term, you definitely would have these huge financial costs because you have to run both programs simultaneously. But yeah, we're supposed to assume that in the future, sometime down the road, there's this abstract amount of savings that we don't necessarily know if they're gonna happen or not, or if they're gonna actually come to fruition or not. In fact, there's a lot of government programs out there that start off that very way that basically promise long-term savings, but they don't end up actually playing out that way. And what's even more of a problem is a lot of these government programs end up having more programs tacked on to them to basically supplement their shortcomings. But with universal basic income, this problem is even more serious because with universal basic income, once the actual program is in place, it's going to be extremely difficult to get rid of it. And as far as the argument that people that have universal basic income are freed up to basically become innovators or start a business, that's only looking at the argument from one side, because if you think about it from the business owner's perspective, if everyone out there is being offered universal basic income, and there's a lot of people that are going to basically check out of the labor force all together, then as someone who's a business owner to incentivize people to come work at my business, I have to pay a higher wage to basically get that employee. So now it actually ends up being more expensive to start a business and more difficult to start a business rather than easier. I as an individual can wait it out and find the right job for me or at least wait till a job offers me the right income I want. So really to summarize the arguments made against universal basic income is that the proponents for universal basic income make huge assumptions. Any benefit that someone would have because they have free time is going to be offset by by the people that end up having a negative impact on society. Universal basic income is definitely going to be more expensive in the short run, and we're supposed to assume that the long-term savings is going to offset that short-term impact. And while automation is certainly coming, there's been advances in technology before, and yet we still have a society where people still have jobs and still have an income. So to summarize both sides of the argument, on the one hand, you have a real concern as far as job loss due to automation. There's a concern that real value has to be attributed to these jobs that have more of an abstract value such as parenting. And on top of that, there's basically a push to simplify government programs and basically simplify the way we distribute welfare. On the other hand, we have an extreme concern as far as lost productivity and an extreme cost in the short run. There's more of a push to focus on welfare programs that are somewhat working right now rather than just implement a whole new entire program. In the end, I hope this video helps you see the complexity as far as universal basic income because with every single economic debate and every single economic issue, there's two sides to the argument. If you enjoyed this video at all, please let others know about it and you know comment down below your thoughts on this argument hopefully in a healthy type manner and not necessarily an aggressive type way or if you have any ideas as far as another economic issue you want to see two sides and both sides of the argument for let me know down below and if you want to stay tuned for future economic debate issues and seeing both sides of those arguments you're going to want to make sure to hit that subscribe button and i hope to see you in the next one